Uh, it's a real joy to be here with you. Uh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure to connect with the AMA and, of course, the opportunity to connect with so many from all over the world. Uh, I think we are living in wonderful times of opportunity to connect globally. Uh, and when I started in, in missions, it was kind of very, very uh, far away to think of coming to Asia, going to India, going to Africa, and meeting people who were serving God, you know, church leaders, Christian leaders, and missionaries from these different parts of the world. And today we have the opportunity to, to work together, not just to meet, but to work together. So it's a, it's a real joy. And, uh, and I think um, <coughs> the privilege that we have, we need to make the most of it. We need to use these opportunities to advance. And it was wonderful to hear the challenge from uh, the PMA this morning. Uh, so let me just share a little bit about Kongubam with you. Uh, we actually use them, the word cooperation or collaboration. Or, uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very strong concept in our region of the world, uh, the idea of collaboration. Uh, there are banks, a lot of banks around our, our region of the world, which are actually people banks. They're like cooperatives, networking banks or people banks. And, and so the word cooperation is very important for us, and that's why it's on the name of our network or group. Um, we are about coming together to collaborate and cooperate. Uh, you, have, you have a paper that we have uh, shared with you. It's in, the, in your book. Um, I don't need to tell you everything that's in there, but I wanted to briefly share some of the points in there. But before I do that, um, I wanted to say that we were wanting to share with you about how we f are following Christ, following Jesus into mission around the world. The mission is his. And we need to all be very, very clear that we are actually doing his work. We don't own it. It's his work. And... He wants to make changes sometimes. He wants to perhaps change our agendas. He wants to modify um, ideas and concepts that we've had, that we've held perhaps very dear for a long, long time. And uh, so we are trying to do that. We're trying to figure out what, what's going on and, and trying to adapt to what God is doing, what God is wanting to do. So learning from one another. And one of the things we do to, to, to do that is we do research. And through research, we're trying to figure out, so, you know, well, what are some of the things that are happening and that we're doing well, that we're not doing well, what others are doing well, so we can do better. But before I do go further, I wanted to tell you that my first mission is actually this group of uh, four, me plus four, my wife, Elba, who is a teacher at a local school there, has a huge mission field right there because she teaches among very unreached local people uh, right there. Great need. And my oldest son, the one in the, in the yellow shirt, he's uh, studying, has finished his studies now, but in the process of becoming a, becoming a missionary pilot. Uh, my second son on the left, uh, Esteban, the first, the oldest is Lucas. My wife is Elba, Esteban. Uh, has changed his study program because he figured that he's not studying what he, or what God has called him to, to, to study because he wants to serve God with whatever God calls him to do. So he was doing uh, chemical engineering, he's changing to ag agriculture, pretty different. And my youngest, uh, uh, my daughter Amanda, uh, wanted to be a vet, a veterinarian. She's still there struggling to figure out if that's what she wants to do, but she's taking on a second major in university, which is in global resources. Uh, and she wants to connect whatever she studies with global opportunities, <coughs> excuse me, to, to serve God. So it's a wonderful privilege to have a family that loves God and wants to serve him. We, we thank God for that. Yeah, one, one experience I had a few years back was um, when our first son was born, I first took him in, in my arms I prayed right there, and then I said, God, this is first fruits, and so this is yours. I will commit him to you, and I'll give him to you. So about five years ago, so they were all bigger now, um, one day I was going to speak at a missions conference, and I'm walking towards the center, the location of the event, and I'm 
talking to God about what I'm going to share. And I was thinking about that day when, when I made that commitment to God, and, uh, and God was already, had already called him. We didn't push him to, to do that. It all came out of his mind. And God spoke to me, yeah, okay, you gave me the first two. What about the last? Uh, for the first one, what about the last two? And so I said, sure, God, they are yours as well. So it's a privilege and a joy. A little bit about Comey Band and Iberia America. Iberia America is a funny word for many of you, but it is composed of what we, you know, what is called Latin America, many of you know, and uh, the Iberian Peninsula. So Spain and Portugal, those two little countries in Southern Europe. Um, <clears throat> and um, so that's the region of the world where we serve and collaborate. And <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Comey Band was born uh, bringing together Christian leaders from all of those countries to talk about mission, to talk about the mission of God, to talk about the opportunities of serving God around the world in his mission. And, uh, and, and so 25 countries, we, Comibam just serves national mission networks in those 25 countries. Some are very small, some are bigger, very active, and have their uh, strong mission emphasis and a lot of work similar to what's happening in the Philippines. So just to give you a little bit of a perspective of the history of how, of, how all of this developed, of course, Comey Bam. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you know, the mission movement in, in our part of the world didn't, uh, wasn't a result of the work of Comey Bam. Comey Bam is a result of the mission movement. Uh, people were moving, and, and God was calling the church, and God was calling people to his mission much before we organized as a, as a, as a, as a network, as an alliance of mission. But in um, the early colonial period of between 1840 and 1900, uh, <clears throat> there was some church planting, a lot of focus on church planting within the country, within the region. And, um, and the church began to, to take root and grow in our region of the world. Well, God blessed that. And of course, the work of missionaries was, was very, very important. Uh, we recognize God using people coming to our region of the world to bring the gospel to us. And one of the things we recognize as well is that many of those uh, very, very soon began to equip and train local leaders, pastors, and send them out to plant churches and, um, and uh, reach out to the ends of, of, uh, of our, or the edges of our countries and, and the region, like into the Amazon and, and the tribal groups of our <coughs> countries. A second period was uh, between the 1900s and 1950s when um, <clears throat> there were some initial efforts of sending missionaries from our region of the world to other parts of the world. A lot of the work was actually sending missionaries to countries, neighboring countries, and missionaries into the tribal groups in the, in the, uh, in the countries itself, but some going uh, further away, like people going back to Europe from Latin America, and some even going to uh, Asia and Africa as well. Uh, and then some of the first non-denominational or interdenominational mission agencies started coming up and, uh, and growing from that period. Uh, very strong emphasis on reaching the tribal groups in our part of the world. One of the joys we have today is to be able to say that there are about 35 major languages from our part of the world that do not have a project of Bible translation among them at this point of about 500 languages. So phenomenal work has been done over the past 100 years or so of reaching out to the tribal groups in our own part of the world, translating the Bible, at least beginning projects of translating the Bible into those languages and reaching out to them. There's large um, communities of tribal churches now. Actually, they now have a mission movement that's bigger than ours. Pastors and uh, leaders of Christian um, groups among the tribal groups have formed an alliance and they are doing a lot of work themselves, reaching out to other tribal groups, and we, we praise God for that. It's a wonderful answer to prayer. 
A third period is uh, from 15, 1950 to 1980, when there was significant mobilization, recruiting, training, and sending of missionaries to the most needy and unreached people groups of the world. Uh, it was still very small numbers in those early years, and a lot of mistakes were made. Um, and we're still building on that, and beginning to uh, help those organizations, the mission movement, to grow and to do better work. But um, God had blessed the church. The church started responding to the opportunities, to the challenges, and mission, cross-cultural mission, began to grow during that period. A fourth period is a period of growth and expansion between 1980 and 2000. Um, the whole challenge of creative access countries was a big issue at that point. How do we get in? For us, like for perhaps Philippines, the Filipinos, and for many others here, the Africans and others, visas were a big, big, big challenge for us. Uh, when I first went into Central Asia, uh, I got my first visa was a three-month visa. Then I had to leave the country, uh, come back with another three-month visa. And then from there on, it was a 15-day visa. So I had to leave the country every 15 days and come back. Actually, I had to go apply for a new visa, get it set. It was not just going across the border and coming back. Apply for a new visa, wait for it for a few hours. They'd stamp it in my passport and come back. And I had to do that about six times before I was able to get a student visa to stay in the country that I was serving in. But those challenges were, you know, uh, you know challenges are good for our faith, right? And for, um, for when we were beginning to grow into things. We were teenagers or children in missions at that time. Children and teenagers love challenges. So we were in the challenges and God was using those challenges to make this movement grow. And then what we call our fifth period, which we believe we're still in, and uh, we're go going through that period, is when we begin to learn more about partnering and maturing and partnering in mission with other groups. Um, so we believe that God has taken us from a historical event to a cooperative uh, effort and collaboration in mission. This is the... Uh, the uh, theme of our first event, our first congress, which was Light for the Nations in 1987 in Sao Paulo. Three, about 3,000, over 3,000 Christian leaders came together at that event and uh, began to talk about and uh, pray about how to work together and, <coughs> excuse me, and collaborate in the mission. So from 1996, when we first started collecting information, we had about 286 mission organizations in our region, and in 2006, when we last collected that information, there were 462, and we've now we're now busy updating that information. We already know that there is a 10% growth on that uh, at this point. We believe it's going to be a bit more than that by the time we finish collecting that information. So, some characteristics of this mission movement. It's always been church-based. It's always been pastors and Christian leaders from our own region deciding to come together and pray together to develop mission, cross-cultural mission work. It's been mission from the margins in one sense because it's mostly smaller churches, uh, smaller groups coming together to try and, and serve together. So we believe it's, it's strong because it's not the big powerful groups that have formed it, but the smaller, weaker groups coming together, pray together, and uh, so collaborate, collaboration has been very, very important. Integral mission, so it's always been about not just preaching the gospel, but reaching out to the needy, both in our own region as well as international uh, mission and cross-cultural mission as well. Well-trained, it hasn't been that way always, but we have grown in that. Out of those about 462, about 200 are mission training centers of various kinds. Uh, so there's a huge emphasis on mission training centers and mission training for um, the people that we send out. And then a need for creativity. We don't always do it uh, the same way everybody else does and, and doesn't work. And so God has uh, given us the opportunity to 
think through how do we do it, how do we do mission, do we do mission support the same way, do we uh, equip them the same way, do we relate to the church in the same way, how do we do it. And then of course there's a huge potential to produce new human and financial resources and God is beginning to answer prayers and, and open up more opportunities to recruit more, to equip more, to send more, to help more missionaries overseas and then to support them as well. And a big, big emphasis for us is on prayer. We have a very strong prayer movement behind our mission effort and, uh, and God, we believe that that is a key to what God is doing from the Ibero-American Mission Movement. Thank you. <laughs>